Building good leads in bug bounty hunting isn't about running a ton of tools. It's about knowing where to dig in. Today, I'll show you how to set up your recon system for just under $60 that can actually help you find real opportunities and not just noise. We're going to dive into passive and active calling using tools like Katana and Wayback URLs or even way more. And then I'll show you when each one makes sense with real world examples. Forget random scans. This is all about focused recon that actually works. When we talk about recon, what we're really talking about is lead generation. It's about knowing where to focus, spotting the interesting stuff and deciding what's worth digging into. Think about it this way. Every asset you discover is a potential entry point, but not all of them deserve your time. Let's talk about two strategies that actually work and get results. First is active calling. Picture yourself exploring a building. You're walking through every room, opening doors, checking corners. That is basically what Katana does. It visits URLs in real time, follows links, and maps out the entire application as it exists right now. It's detailed but it also means you're directly interacting with the target. Then there's passive calling with way more or way back URLs. Instead of exploring the building yourself, imagine you're flipping through old photos. You're pulling data from web archives to see what used to exist. This can uncover old endpoints, dev environments, or features that were rolled back but never fully removed. Here's the magic though. Active calling finds right Active calling finds what's right in front of you, while passive calling digs up what others have forgotten about. Each of these have its own time and place. Knowing when to use each one is a real game changer. But in order to do any of this, we need to have a reliable system. And I'm going to show you how to set up a VPS on your own with under $60 per year. Because if you use your own personal laptop, there is going to be some downsides of maybe crawling a little too aggressively and getting your entire IP banned and not being able to access other websites. So for that reason, I'm going to use Hostinger to set up a VPS and do all of our testing from there. So the first thing we're going to do is go to hostinger.com slash Nahamsek. They're currently doing a massive sale so you can get boxes for as cheap as $5 a month. We're going to click this choose plan. We can either opt in for 24 months, but if you want to do it for under $60, like I mentioned earlier, you can drop into 12 months, click on the have a coupon code, and enter my code Nahamsek, which will give you an additional 10% off. It also helps fund some of these videos that I'm making for this channel, and it will drop your entire order for under $60. We're going to press continue. Here is where it's going to ask you for all your billing information. I'm going to just skip that really quickly. And once we finish putting our information, we're going to have our box set up, which now we can actually go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to do here is it's going to take us to the panel and it's going to allow us to pick a location, which I like to say central. I'm going to do Phoenix right here, press continue. And the cool thing that I like a lot about Hostinger is that you can either pick a traditional operating system, or if you want to just use Kali Linux, it gives you the option to actually boot a Kali Linux on here, which is great, especially for people like us or bug bounty hunters and don't want to just set up their box every time they get a new server. So this allows you to just have your Kali Linux box in the cloud and have all of your tools right there and then. And then now we're going to hit finish setup after we give in our password and we're going to give it a couple minutes. This is going to be done. And then I'm going to show you how to run our tools and create leads to find good vulnerabilities or places to focus on when it comes down to your bug bounty hunting or pen testing. For this video though, I'm going to skip all the installation process. I'm going to assume you know how to do those. In case you don't know, just go to each of those tools, GitHub repositories, look at the installation guide, copy paste the commands and install them. And if you need to install Go, it's super easy. On Kali, all you have to type in is go into the terminal and it's going to give you the package manager that says apt go install or something similar to that. You can install it and get it over with. But for now, let's skip all of that and dive into how to use these tools with a live target. So I'm going to quickly start off with some recon. I've already done this. We're just going to open up our fort.com. These are all the assets that we have. I'm just going to pick something at random that has the keyword API in it. So I'm going to run this. It's going to show us everything that has an API on it. I want to kind of show you how we just use this to create leads just based on something super random. I'm just going to click on this one. We're going to quickly open up our browser, go to this website, and you can see it comes back as a website that is responding, but is serving us a 404. It means that there's no content for us to see. The approach here usually is to do some content discovery with some FF, maybe whatever content discovery tools that you like, and seeing that you can find anything. But I want to show you why Katana in this case isn't something that we can do because Katana only works where there is content already being shown, like a website, like a login page that we can go after and look at the content that is already being served. So in this case, since we're getting a 404, Katana is not going to be useful. And you can see it just came back. There's no results at all. But now we want to take a look at Wayback URL, which I'm going to actually use Wayback URLs with no configurations at all. I'm just going to echo the same website. 
and I'm going to feed it to Wayback URLs. And you can see right off the bat, it's coming back with a ton of data. It's actually giving us uh, a little bit of like a personalization V1 with a UUID. We can go into here and see if it loads, for example, maybe not this one. But what if you wanted to look for other stuff? I'm sure there's going to be other stuff in here. We have another log, for example, that we can go to. This one looks like it is password protected. So something we can maybe look for weak passwords or credentials like that. I'm sure there's going to be a couple other ones. There's FMA right here. There's DCO. All of these are potentially areas that we can focus on. You can see there is more and more of them. There is UDL map, something that our brute force wouldn't have found because the UDL map wouldn't be in our word list. This thing right here as well. I'm going to try it out. It looks like this one is coming back with something that says 405. This doesn't allow the header or whatever the reason may be, but you can see that it's giving us leads. The lead here that I talk about is looking at these patterns and folders or endpoints that we can go after. If you look at this URL right here, what we have is SFF-CLOC. That is something that 100% of the time I would probably not find with something like FF because I don't have that in my word list. And if you look at it, it is not also the name of the API and the asset itself right here. If we look, that is not mentioned anywhere. So this is a really good way to use passive data from a Wayback URLs or Web Archives to, to pull things that we can hack on. Let's do that one more time. All of these are different areas that you can focus on. And honestly, let's think about it this way. This is just one tool, Wayback URL. You can use something like Waymore that actually pulls some different sources outside of just the internet web archives like this one. And just compile a massive list of all the different assets that are hosted on this domain. So keep that in mind. This is a prime example of taking an asset instead of giving up on it. We see a 404, we feed it into Wayback URL. Even though we don't expect much to come out of it, we're passively getting leads that we can hack on. Maybe there's an actuator behind this. Maybe there's an API endpoint that leaks data. Some of these UUIDs that I can see right here, if we go up right here, for example, some of these is an auth, for example, that has some IDs that we can test and play around with. This was has an unset token URL. This one has an app ID. All of these are just data and things that we can dig into. And this is only one asset. We're not going after everything with API. It's just simply one of them. And if we wanted to do this, what we can do is kind of set up the same thing. Instead of doing an echo, all I have to do is do a sub finder. And instead of doing a dash O, I can just do a grep and look for everything that starts with an API. I'm just going to do it like this. And then feed it into Wayback URLs, have it just focus on API hacking, where it's going to look for passive data without touching their website directly, without making any requests and hoping that we find things that we can hack on. So you can see this is just a prime example. This is what I would do typically when I'm just mass scanning assets, just to be able to focus on a particular point or just find a niche that I want to hack on, especially when it comes down to API hacking or just assets that sometimes don't make sense. But before we continue, I need you to do me a favor. I want to hear from you. What is the biggest thing that you struggle with after your reconnaissance process? Is it something like crawling and finding leads that you don't know what to do? Or is it more that you don't know where to go or what assets to prioritize? I want to hear from you. And this also helps me create content in the coming weeks. And I still want to help you get to your $100,000. So unless you give me some sort of a comment and pointers, I can't help you to drop me a comment. Let me know. And now let's get back into the video. And now that this is getting done, we have a bunch of new leads. And you can see I've written this one actually in a file right here. So it is in wayback.txt. What I'm going to do here is I want to test out this entire concept one more time show you how you can just grab some of these and see if the website shows anything first so this one looks like this one doesn't exist but this just kind of gives us information about how the api is created let's try one more i'm going to go maybe down here pick this one looks like this is 404 we just kind of have to go through all these but if you look at this this is all a little boring this one is actually coming back and it's uh, showing us some content and if we go to this 404 but this is very manual. Here's one more thing that I think you should do. There's two ways to approach the next step of this. The first step is to just kind of open our files and do an HTTPX and get all the content length, or we can just actually open up our way back text and just feed it to HTTPX and just maybe get the response size. I'm just going to actually run the dash H. We're going to look for response code. So a status code does dash CS. I'm going to feed that into here and easily we can just see what is available throughout all these URLs, what is coming back as a 404, which 404 itself doesn't necessarily mean that it's not available. You could see a 404 that's an API, for example, if it's a route for an API, those are something that you have to figure out. But if you keep going down these, there's going to be some that are coming back as 200. So for example, this one, if I go back to my browser, it is coming back as 200. I don't know what this is, but this is a really good rabbit hole to go down and understand what is this UID submitted? What does it do? Can I do anything with it? Is there any PII attached to it? 
can we just go down this rabbit hole and look for more stuff? This is a really good way to automate this process. Just focus on things that are coming back as 401 or maybe 200s. And you can see this list is going to go on and go on and go on. That's one approach. The other approach that I like to do that's even better is actually taking screenshots using HTTPX. I'm not going to show you that one. It's super easy. It's very similar to this. It's just going to make the video a lot longer. All you have to do is use the screenshot capabilities of HTTPX, take screenshots and go through them. Super, super simple. That is one way to do this, especially when you have a ton of data. You can also refine that search with HTTPX and make it so it only takes screenshots of things that are coming back as 200 because if there's a 200 coming back from something like an API V1 with a UUID and it leaks data, we know exactly where it came from. We know the URL and we have a screenshot that proves that there is PII being leaked and you have a vulnerability right there and then. And more than likely, there's going to be other API endpoints on there that is vulnerable that you can go after. So that was just the first step of this video is passively looking for content that could turn into places that we can focus on and look for vulnerabilities. Okay, now that we get the passive approach out of the way, let's talk about active. When it comes to the active crawling, again, we're going to use a tool. This time we are making requests. Every time we see a link, Katana is going to click on it, see what it leads to, and then make an index of all those for us. For this example, I'm going to use one of my hubs from Hacking Hub. It is a part of one of my courses. I'm going to use it because it just makes more sense to show you on a vulnerable instance and something that I'm authorized to test, which is finding some random target that may disclose vulnerabilities. So what I'm going to do here is this is Naham store. It's a part of one of our certificates. All we're going to do is grab this URL and we're going to go to Katana and say echo here. And then we're going to actually send this to Katana, but we're going to actually have it do a JS crawl. It's also going to look at JavaScript files and look for endpoints. And as you can see, it's going to just give us a couple of these endpoints. There is a product picture. It looks like this could be really cool to test something like a local file disclosure. This one has some product stuff. Maybe we can leak some product details. This is all really cool. The point of doing a active approach of crawling versus using Wayback URLs is to see the website as it is today. So it is going to discover endpoints that are available on this website today that we can test. But there's something that most people miss here, and that is the unauth approach to doing this. As you can see, a lot of these are accessible publicly, but I feel like this website has more uh, functionality if we log in. So right now I've made an account. I have logged in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a refresh. It is going to give us this request right here. I'm going to just grab my cookie and feed it to Katana and say, now scan it with our cookie. So I'm going to give it a header cookie and do this. And if we look at the results, I'm willing to bet there's going to be way more endpoints to look at. And you can see already on the screen, it's coming back with more endpoints like login. There's login redirect, which it's kind of fair for us to see it. We can see there's a difference in the results that we get. What I'm trying to show you here is this is something that you can automate. You can go and do the same thing as our last approach, get a bunch of subdomains, feed it to Katana, have it crawl. That's great. It works. But what if you have a sign-in in front of you? You have to make sure you do this as a part of your manual approach because mapping out an entire application is really, really difficult. The cool thing about doing this with an approach that you are authenticated is you can feed it to HTTPX and kind of play around with the results, do screenshots and things like that. If you use a tool like Burp Suite as your crawler, then you're just waiting for that to be done. And then I personally don't like doing that because even though you can copy and paste those links from Burp, it's just as limited and you have to just transfer data back and forth a bunch of times. And that's not something that I want to do. So keep that in mind. The next time that you're deciding which one you want to use, you can do both. You don't have to do one or the other, but sometimes it doesn't make sense to use Katana. Katana isn't going to have any data, especially when there isn't anything to crawl, when there's a 404 page or maybe an Apache index page. None of those are something that it can crawl. So that's why we rely on tools like Wayback URLs or way more. But then on the other side, if there is something that you can authenticate to, make sure you are giving it to Katana or you find a way to authenticate using Katana or other web crawlers like Hack Crawler and all the other ones that are out there and crawl the website because if it's a massive website, you're not going to be able to discover every single endpoint and every single functionality and doing something like Katana is going to get a list of those. Then you can find out what those URLs are or how to access those API functionalities and start testing it. All right, that's it. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, become a no homie, hit that like button on this video and drop me a comment. Let me know, do you want to see more content like this? I'm kind of still trying to gauge what to make for this year. My goal is to help you hit your 100K or help you make your first $100,000 or get you to the path of making $100,000 a year. But unless you tell me what kind of content you want to see, I can't help you. So help me help you, then drop me a comment and I will see you all in next week's video.